<laughs> Here we go. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I'm Christy Lowe. I'm your host, and I am, as always, so glad that you are here with us. I'm joined today by Jerry Howard, and I am thrilled for this conversation for a lot of reasons, one of which is you're just about to meet a really cool dude. Jerry and I met at a conference and just struck up a cool conversation. He has an incredible story. We're going to talk about everything today from faith and business and leadership and alcoholism and probably talk about our stories versus balancing the commands and the, the demands of our life. We've got, we're talking about everything today, but Jerry, I just want to say thank you and welcome to the show. Christy, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited about not only what you do in the podcast world, but how you help people. So again, mm -hmm. anything I can contribute to that is a blessing to me. Well, I'm excited for it. This is one of the conversations I've been so excited to have because my listener family probably knows. And if you haven't been listening very long, I have like this, this quiet, I'm like a leadership junkie. Like I love leadership mm -hmm. podcast and leadership books. I like to read that stuff for fun. I'm weird like that, but my husband and I both, that's one of our connecting threads has always been. And I think that what I realized over years is that it's not always about your position and you don't always have a quote unquote title, but you always have influence. And having you here today is going to be, that's what I'm excited about. But before we jump in, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Oh, good. Well, I'm Jerry Howard. I live in Richmond, Virginia. I have been married for over 22 years. So I've been happily married for 22 years, but I've been following the Lord since 2010. So what mm -hmm. I like to say is that my wife's been happily married for almost 15. Uh, because <laughs> Jesus in my life has been the thing that made me not this arrogant as good, egocentric. What's the other one? Narcissistic? Just name it. I yeah. had all kinds of challenges that the Lord's helping me walk through, but my family is also important to me. And we've got four kids, two in college, a uh, 20 year old and 18 year old, and then two in middle school that are 12 and almost 11. And that's been my world, not only since walking with the Lord, but even before that, I, even as a child, I always knew I wanted to be a family person. Even when my wife and I were dating, she would say like, cause she's very career oriented and did really well in college. She didn't have to go twice like I did. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll you got to, to go twice. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I, well, it sounds like, oh, well, because you have your master's degree. Well, yes, I do have an MBA. But so if, if we count that as the third time, then I had to go three <laughs> times, right? So I was on the nine year bachelor program. Nice. We um, say that we crammed four years into nine, like you just crammed them yeah. real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's it. So even as a child, I knew I wanted to have kids and, I, I remember telling her when we were dating that I wanted to have a white picket fence and a bunch of rugrats. And, and so we ultimately had that dream, but it wasn't, it wasn't possible without the Lord. In fact, because of my alcoholism, I almost destroyed our family before half of it had even been created. And so that's really the biggest value, I think, of my two smaller kids is when I look at them, I realize that, hey, without the presence of the Lord, not only would they not exist, but yeah. my two older children certainly would have been on a fast track to all manner of failure that I experienced because there'd be no logical reason for them not to walk in my footsteps unless they see me in the pursuit of change. And that's really what I think the Lord has done for me as a leader of our family is despite all of the flaws, characteristics, my, my older ones know that I went to jail for my DUIs and yeah. all that kind of stuff. They know that, but it doesn't, it doesn't factor into their daily decision because they see that I'm making progress. They see that I'm changing. And so if I had to say, hey, what do you want people to know about your life, particularly your family? It's I was always in the pursuit of trying to be a better version of myself. And I know that the Lord Jesus is the only way that's possible. So a lot of people say I'm trying to be a better me. That's cool. But what if you would just be more like Jesus? Because inherently, not only would you have the perfect blueprint for what your life should look like, but also you would know that there's no ego involved in that because he's going to have you do some things that you don't want to do. So True. the Lord's a huge presence in our family and our lives. And not unlike many people, I ended high school as most likely to succeed. College, yeah, I was a good, pretty good high school kid. It was all about putting up that image though. Mm, um, yeah. And it was like, I'll give you an example real quick. So I, some of my classes were a little bit easier for me than others. So I would go to the bathroom and that might take 30 minutes, 
but I always made sure that I ran into a teacher or a principal, even if only for two or three minutes, so that the reason for my taking so long was I was talking to Mr. Oli, the principal at the time, right? So nice. you can see how that cleverness became the beginning of what would ultimately be quite the drinking problem and all kinds of challenges. But when I got to Virginia Tech, I was a in the cadre or I was in the Corps of Cadets. Okay. And then my sophomore year, I had a very coveted position called cadre corporal, which is not unlike a drill instructor. Did great at that. My freshmen were number one in the line company. So we did, me and Kristen did a good job training them, as well as this gentleman named Larry Lohman. So for all intents and purposes, still looking good. But I had by this time quite the chip on my shoulder. And awesome. so just through that egotistical perspective on leadership and the leaders appointed above me really started questioning their judgment openly, but also started drinking. And wow, what a you know crazy world that became. So within four years, I was a college dropout. Hmm. Uh, so, so you, you just dropped like, out. It wasn't like you got kicked out or anything correct. like that. You, you dropped oh, yeah. out. Yeah. I was in, I just started my fifth year. Who drops out of college after four years? <laughs> That would be this I, guy. You're right? not the only person I know, though, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so in my fifth year, I was looking down the barrel of yet another major change, mm -hmm. changing of my major, I should say. But the interesting dynamic was I was so hardheaded. I just wanted to be the guy that had a physics degree. So I you wanted a physics, physics degree. Hold on. Yeah. Physics? Yeah. Like, but you want to know why? Okay. Why? Because I liked MacGyver. <laughs> That is a great reason to get a physics degree, Jerry. He's cool, That's... but he's a fictional yeah. character and you cannot model your life after a fictional character. Oh, here's no. another one for you. Why did I want to be a Marine Corps officer? Why? Because I liked Star Trek The Next Generation. And to be a Marine Corps officer was as close as you could get to Starfleet. And <laughs> I, I didn't go to conventions or anything like that or put on the uniforms, but I liked how they made decisions and they always seemed to know what to do. Hmm. Uh, and so I really got a kick out of that. But again, when your entire life's goals are based on fictional characters from TV, and yeah. I didn't grow up in church, so I didn't have a foundation in faith, then all of, you can see how the house of cards is just getting taller and it's it's bound to fail. And that's really yeah. what happened. I got two years into a physics degree, was getting A's in public speaking and A in pub public relations, creative writing, all these business of things. Of course you were. And C's and D's in my physics, physics class. It just wasn't interesting. The more you learn, the less you know is really yeah. how physics works. But here's the point. The College of Arts and Sciences was where physics and math were. The mm -hmm. college of the School of Business was where business was. But because my overall grades were so low, like 2.1 or 1.7, whatever it was, I couldn't get into the School of Business. So I couldn't switch oh. majors outside of. So I had to switch to math. That didn't go well either. It was even worse than physics. Because so, it was math. Let's just yeah. go ahead. And, sorry, all you math geeks out there. So funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm relatively good at math, but sitting oh, there digging through all that, all those letters just did not interest me. And so finally I dropped out because I was looking down the barrel of like five high level, 400 level, senior level math classes. And you, no one can really do that in one semester. And that's what it would have taken. So I dropped out. And then got a full-time job, but continued to party, alcohol, drugs, all that kind of stuff. And then 9-11 happened. And mm -hmm. that was the changing point because I was already dating my wife, my future wife. And she was valedictorian of her college. I, I always say that I married up, but I don't like to say that too loud. Same, same. But yeah. What does that mean to you about your wife? Did they marry down? Like My husband did. I say that I was circling the drain when I yeah. met John. Yeah, because yeah, I was not too far off of you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, and that's it. So I believe God sent her to me to Absolutely. say, hey, kid, you got to snap out of it because you are losing it. And so I 9-11 happens. I, of course, start thinking about the military a little bit. I'd love for people to think that I was just 100% patriotic. And so I joined the Marines right after 9-11, which sounds good on a resume or one sheet. But yeah. the, the, the fact of the matter is I knew I needed to change my life. And I knew that the Marine Corps could do that for me. I had been an officer candidate for two years already. So I already knew the whole, all the knowledge and all that kind of stuff. So boot camp was just an acclimation process. It wasn't a lot I had to learn. And so it wasn't nearly as scary to me, I think, that than it would be to most. And mind you, I was 23 by this time, had already lived on my own for two years, paying bills, all that kind of stuff. It was actually a respite because I don't have to worry about bills and didn't have to go to a job per se. I just, they feed you every, you know, three days, you know, three three or four hours, they feed you. So mentally, well, 
It and it amazing. sounds like there was a little bit of an identity, like there's a lack of identity here. Like you didn't know who you were. You're like, Absolutely. you're people who can't see us on video or like, yeah, yeah. it was your flout. And the only reason I say that is because this chick understands that. Like, I did not understand how God had wired me. And you know, I have a degree in PE and biology. Okay. And then I had been in real estate, which was a wonderful thing for me for a number of years, but God had wired me like this and I had resisted and fought it and done all sorts of things. And when we fight it, all that does to us in the inside and the turmoil. So I'm just seeing all this floundering and you try and then God bringing you to who you really are. Well, and that's it. So when you're as hard headed as I am, plus hmm. fever, you overachieve at being a hard headed person, right? Like yeah. that's the bottom line is that. And that's yeah. so once the Lord got to hold to me, right? So let me fast forward a little bit. I joined the Marine Corps, relatively good career. And what I mean by that is my drug use ended, but my alcoholism hit manifold. Continued. But I was stationed with a non deployable unit. Uh, okay. safely tucked away in the Mojave Desert of California, of Southern California, Love where it. there's, you know, we lived off base because I had ultimately got married to my wife. Yay. Okay. Uh, I had two kids in diapers, went back to school, graduated with honors, MBA with honors. For all intents and purposes, my corporate resume looked great. But again, identity crisis like crazy. I was thinking when I got out of the Marine Corps, I would be hired into some management degree or management well, training program for executives. God's good because that ultimately happened. But yeah. by 2008, I was looking down the barrel of 60, six, six months of what we call straight time, which was part of a 12 month commuted sentence for my second DUI in 12 months. Okay. So I was going to ask, when did you know you had a problem? Yeah. And, so long before yeah. that, but I was like, oh, it's okay. fine. Because you quit every 90 days, right? You have some kind of, my my alcoholism wasn't like, I need a shot to wake up. It was, mm -hmm. okay, after a great day, I'll have a couple of beers. And then two days later, I might have five or six. And a week later, I might have a 12 pack or some shots. And mm -hmm. then, but every 90 days, I would have like these all nighters or some kind of crazy incident, punching a door, or in this case, DUIs. Yeah. And when you go from the Mojave Desert, where there's one police officer to Richmond, Virginia, where there's two police forces, multiple counties of it, and they cross over and all that, you're going to get pulled. It's inevitable. And so my poor habits of living off base in the Marine Corps, because all you had to do was just not go on base. If you okay. just didn't go on Stayed. base, you were pretty much safe. And that wasn't even really safe because I had I hadn't wrecked a vehicle, but I mm -hmm. almost did a couple of times and destroyed some rims and popped some tires and all kinds of stuff. So the writing was on the wall. It was clearly obvious I had a problem with alcohol, but it, it took the judge on the first DUI to order the interlock device on my car. Oh, okay. What's that? Me, it's What's basically interlock? a device that you blow into to make the car start. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I yeah. just didn't know what it was called. Okay. Yeah. They call it an interlock and it basically prevents your ignition from starting unless you blow no alcohol at, at all. Well, I, again, hardheaded, not only that, but an overachieving hardhead. <laughs> I just didn't <laughs> really do it. good at it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do what he said. I just didn't do what the judge ordered. And so then, of course, that resulted in a second DUI. So, wait a minute. How'd you get around it? I just didn't check in or anything. I didn't do anything they said. I did the, they had a little weekend thing where you show up on the weekend and you do two days or whatever of jail. Yeah. I did yeah. that. And then they said, okay, get the interlock. And I just didn't. And no one said anything. So I just didn't do it. Well, then I got another DUI. Well, because of that DUI, it was obviously I hadn't followed the orders the first time. So that resulted in, so this is three misdemeanor charges because one is called a show cause that you didn't do whatever you did before. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially three misdemeanor. Could have, they could have charged me with habitual offender would have been a felony. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't, by the grace of God. And then also God's intervention. When I was in the jail, I had done a couple of weeks. I got the attorney to switch all of my jail time to weekend duty. And so what? Ha so if you think about Jerry and his corporate resume, his shiny glittering image is what I call it. Mm -hmm. I went from most likely to succeed just a few years later to being in jail straight time. But through that process, learn to A, quit drinking and B, submit my life to the Lord. Well, fast forward from 2008 to 2013, I've gone from jail cells to a CEO position running a continuing care retirement community. 
And what was the difference? The difference was I quit drinking. 18 months later, I become a disciple of Jesus. And yeah. then two and a half years after that, I become the CEO and, and had a illust illustrious business yeah. career in healthcare. How did you quit drinking? What'd that look like? I did not want to show up to court and have to lie and say I wasn't drinking. I, I really okay. just, it, it smacked me upside the head. So July 10th of 2008, I quit drinking, called mm -hmm. AA, went to a couple of meetings, and then was able to 30 days later tell the judge that, hey, for the last 30 days, I've been sober and I've been going to AA. And I had a sponsor show up with me. So it was all about, again, putting forth that image. But there was a, there was a bit of humility wrapped into that because sure. I had, of course, destroyed every kind of possibility of awesomeness. But I remember praying to God in 2008 and I said, knelt down over the coffee table and I said, Lord, if you're real, you can make all this go away at the snap of your fingers. <laughs> I already know where this is going. I so, do, but I want to hear it anyways. <laughs> I, I earnestly prayed with my eyes closed. And so I opened my eyes three, three to five seconds later, because that's how long a non-believer prays. And, <laughs> and of course, nothing had changed except the second hand on the clock, right? But here's what's interesting. Nothing changed then. But if you fast forward, I did quit drinking. I went to AA, I finished my jail weekend thing. And then early 2009, my wife and I were getting out of the jail stuff because she would pick me up and drop me off with two kids. Yeah. Uh, Which, by the way, we haven't even mentioned, she's a saint for the record. I don't uh, know her. Let me tell you but, what. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe she stuck it out, man. I really can't. Again, I, I believe God sent her because yeah. I, I was headed off. And I do believe that if I would have reached my goals originally in college, that I still think we would have met and got married and everything, but it just would have been a different first 10 years of our marriage sure. uh, because I, I could see how that still would have, would have worked out. But the reason I bring all that up is because when you look on LinkedIn and you look on the website and all these kind of what I call glittering image things, you're going to, wow, look at the CEO. Isn't he so awesome? Ooh, business coach. Yay. Well, I always say, don't let the hair fool you because <laughs> that is a corporate resume. My mm -hmm. failure resume, and this is what mm -hmm. I want your listeners to know more than anything about all that. Your failure resume is those moments in which you are either most ashamed or most guilty. And that's when God's strongest. Yes. In your weakness, he is strong. So what does Jesus love about you the most? He loves your failure resume. Yeah. Because those are the moments that draw you closest to him. It's no closer time with the Lord. Now, if you develop a habit of communing with the Lord, which is part of your salvation every day, of course you can draw near to the Lord. And you can do that. And now you got the Lord on tap. That's great. Yeah. yeah. But before that, because we all started as something else, whether a Jew yes. or Gentile. You won't draw near to the Lord unless you really need him. And he knows you need him. You were mm -hmm. wired to need him. And that's where he met me. He met me there looking down the barrel of months of jail, deteriorating family life. My wife and I were apartment shopping and we were going to just live next door so I could see the kids because I wasn't going to be away from my kids. So y'all were going to like separate? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and that's why. So my life became committed to the Lord in early 2010, January 24, 2010 baptized okay. in April of 2010, but I'll refer to 2009 as the year of victory. And the reason mm -hmm. why, because my wife and I were together, we had made that decision. Okay, we're going to stick this thing out. By May of that year, we had a new house. The old landlord had an issue with us about not paying the last month's rent. Now we already paid it, but yeah. he basically took us to court because the lease said first and last month's rent on deposit. So we already had the last month's rent on deposit. Well, the reason why this is significant is because we went to court and we had cleaned the house and painted and all these nice things that, that I just thought people do when they move out of a, a rental. And so we went to court. We were again together and mm -hmm. we did so well. Of course, we won the case because we had already paid him anyway. Yeah. But we did so well when we were in the lobby afterwards, the bailiff actually came out and just looked at us both and said, you guys did a really good job in there. What bailiff follows you out to tell you that kind of thing? Well, nobody. <laughs> a bailiff yeah. under the spirit of the Lord is all I know because yeah. he he didn't we didn't talk about faith or anything. Mind you, I have not committed to the Lord yet. Mm -mm. And this is the Were cool you way. thinking about it? Like was uh, it maybe at AA what? I was saying the Lord's prayer at the end of the meetings, but and, I can't, and was your wife a believer? She was. She's been a believer since okay. she was little. 
which is okay. surprising. Now, she wasn't living an actively Christian life. We weren't going to church or anything like that. But sure. that was obviously my lack of leadership. Because mm. then if you fast forward, we had uh, some other nuances that we just had a bunch of cash. She got a big raise at, at work. I was still selling insurance on the side, but got to spend that summer with my kids a lot more. Yeah. Just a lot of cool things happening. And what I realized in hindsight was that the Lord was revealing himself to me. And then mm -hmm. he was also saying, hey, we're not done yet. We still got some work to do because I'll tell you, even like on Facebook and these social media platforms, still, I'm still having inappropriate conversations with old high school girlfriends and that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. and, oh, there was still some nastiness there with Jerry. And that's the thing. That's the reason why I knew that, hey, I was just replacing something else bad with this yes. previously, you know, bad person, right? And that there was just no heart. There was no heart yeah. there. And so fast forward, I got these Christian business guys just, you know, took a liking to me, started inviting me to Sunday service and, you know, just talking about the Lord. And I was open to it. And then January 24th, you know, it was actually a business guy. He was a guest speaker. He gave his testimony, him and his wife about healing. And what I really loved about him was he had this light about him. Now, of course, there's stage lights, but this was a different yeah. light. This was a, a very convicted light, like, hey, I am on God's team. He and I are in lockstep and we are doing this life thing together. And this guy was not a pastor or preacher. And I was like, I want to be like that guy. I want to talk about God with that conviction. And mm -hmm. that light was the thing that got me saved. I, and to this day, I, his name is Matt. I have not talked to Matt or Elena, you know, ever, quite frankly, because he just did the altar call. And then I got around the people that invited me, right? It wasn't. Yeah. It, it wasn't like I formed a relationship with him, but those business guys that had their cake and eat it too, is what I say, because they you know, had a great life, they had money, they had a great marriage, and they loved the Lord. So they were not only good in their life, but they were righteous living at the same time. Mm. And I wanted that. And so I got recruited to run these small hospitals. And I remember about two years later, I'm sitting across the, the, the desk with one of my directors because the directors reported to me. I was the administrator or CEO. And somehow we got on faith and she said, well, I just assume you're a Christian man. You have this light about you. Oh, and like, oh. And it, ironically, it was two years. It was 2012 or I think it was 13, actually 2013. I had the light and I didn't notice oh. it until later. Like I didn't realize it's what she said until I was thinking about it later. But I remember those words because I had finally got what I wanted. And that's when I realized that marketplace ministry, Christian business leaders, you just because you're a guy and you're a believer doesn't mean you had to be a pastor. In fact, that's just one office in the fivefold ministry offices given us by the Lord. But here's the point. Those are just positions to, to equip the body of Christ. Yes. Within that is the body of Christ, right? And so we yes. have all kinds of positions available in the marketplace that I believe the marketplace is the nation's largest mission field. And if these guys had not been out there just with the head on a swivel, yeah. paying attention to who's who's possibly interested in, and I always say, mm -hmm. just make a friend, right? You don't have to be on the street corner. Nothing wrong with the street corner evangelist. Nothing wrong with going out there and meeting the needs of people on the street and doing that kind of ministry as well. But there's a whole nother world out there in the marketplace where people spend 40 hours a week minimum. And these people today will probably never step foot in a church. Nope. They will listen to you because why? Because you just said, hey, my name's Jerry. What's your name at the lunch yep. table? Right. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're a line worker or the CEO. When I was a hospital administrator, I was the CEO. I spent more time with the housekeepers and the dietary staff than I did with my own directors because they had yeah. jobs to do. I wasn't going to bother them, but I used to roam the halls all the time and just, yeah. and I used to eat lunch in the break room. Right. Like, I'm with them. They used to love that. And that's yeah. CEOs eating lunch with the housekeeper. Yeah. That's cool. And so again, it doesn't matter what your position is. If you just go out there to make a friend and if, because once you make a friend, people are going to start telling you about their lives and you'll mm -hmm. see the opportunity. You don't have to particularly share the faith in the way or any, just talk about your relationship with yeah. the Lord and how he's changed your life. Yeah. And people got, look, Noah did it's not go It's caught, not find, taught. Yeah. Noah times. didn't go find yeah. all the animals. Yeah. God no, they the came to him. to him. And he even yeah. had, God even closed the door for him. God closed the door on the ark for him. So everybody yeah. would be safe. 
you look, you and I and people and everybody, we don't change souls. God does no. the change. We're just right. the vehicle through which that light comes on. Yeah. That, that's really what I learned in those years, particularly. Well, and I think you talk a lot about how I heard you say one time that you like to sit at the intersection of faith, leadership, and business. And I love that that I love that analogy because you there I it, just like you've said, I've heard you say before that it's inseparable. Our lives are meant to be lived fully in the full expression of Christ, regardless of where we are and where we're going. It's in our influence and our influence doesn't, we don't check it when we leave our house, be like, okay, well, I'll pick that back up whenever I come back home tonight. No, you're taking that with you into whatever business situation you're going into. Or if you're working at volunteer gigs or whatever, wherever you are, because my listener family, I have a lot of listeners that work outside the home. Some work inside the home. I have people that are retired, but regardless of your age, that doesn't change your influence. You still have influence no matter where you are. Oh, I would agree. And in fact, a lot of people that think they don't have influence because of mm. their age, all these young people, <laughs> that's so not true. They're not no. talking to you because you're not talking to them. That's right. I can't tell you enough how many times that if, if here's what I'll say, if you're intentional about making a friend, somebody who mm. looks, acts, or thinks differently than you, then mm -hmm. you are doing exactly what the Lord did because yes. the Lord was raised a carpenter and he was, of course, the king of the universe, we'll say, but he didn't have, he wasn't too busy to stop and tell Matthew to come hang out with him for a while. Matthew yeah. was the worst kind of Jew back then. And of course, the prostitutes and women who were unclean because of the issue with blood, Zacchaeus climbed a tree, right? So in the Jewish, nobody ran, men did not run, and they certainly didn't climb trees. So Jesus shouldn't have been talking to that guy for all standards. Yep. Right? So Jerry, CEO, That's wouldn't right. necessarily hang out with the housekeepers. But I mean, my dad's, my mom and dad are blue collar people, right? Like it's not, Same. it's not a big deal. The point is, if God's got you in a place, which he always does, you're on mission. You're yes. on mission. The mission is what? The mission is go and make disciples. The yes. vision is that every woman be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and yes. do exploits in the name of Jesus. That's the vision. And then the, the value statements, as I like to say, are just the big 10, right? So we've got love yeah. God, love others as you love yourself. Well, God's 10 commandments breaks that down really well. And if business leaders, whether they're a leader in business or whether they just lead the housekeeping staff or whatever it is, particularly men, if they would get back to the basic 10, right? Then mm -hmm. we would see a shift in the marketplace today that eliminates all this fear. I think business people in general, whether you're a line worker or whether you're a CEO, walk in a state of fear about their faith. And mm. what I did, because I, I had that too. I remember when I first became a business owner, I wasn't sure what I could do. And so when I think about, okay, what does a, a faith leadership and business guy look like? Well, mm -hmm. he's a person who's a Christian in the marketplace that no one is surprised when they find out he's a Christian, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I just, I assumed you're a Christian because you have this light about you, right? Like that mm -hmm. is a thing that I had not started talking about the way that I do now. I was just running this hospital, doing my job every day, but I was right. doing it in such a way that it glorified the Lord without even really knowing it. But you walk in a state of humility. Mm -hmm. And that's the key is if you're humble to the Lord and you look at the big 10 and say, okay, well, how can I honor the Lord today with my time? people and resources. If you ask that question, he'll make that really obvious to you. He will. Absolutely. And and that's the whole point. If you're a business leader and you're not sure about what to do, we'll find yeah. out. And that's what I did. I went to this training where it was a it was a marketplace ministry company or nonprofit and uh -huh. they had a training about what can Christians do in the marketplace from these two attorneys that were HR attorneys. And here's what I learned. It was I think it was like a half day or maybe a two day maybe one or two days of training. Here's yeah. what you can do. You can do whatever you want. As long as you don't use positional authority to force somebody to participate in the thing that they don't want to participate in that has to do with your faith. That's yeah. it. If you're in a one-on-one -on -one setting and they're sad and hurting, you can ask to pray for them. And yeah. candidly, that is the first step. If you notice somebody is sad and hurting, you say, hey, in my faith, when we have a problem, we pray about it. Is it okay if I pray for you? It yeah. doesn't matter what your position is. You can ask that question and the law says that it's allowed. 
Hmm. And that right there is all you got to do because now that you're this person that cares about them enough yeah. to pray about them when everybody yeah. else is scared to talk about prayer in the marketplace. Well, and don't just say, I'll be praying for you. Just pray for them right oh, yeah. there. My like friend, that drives uh, me crazy. I'm yeah. trying, and I try, I'm trying to get better at that whenever I will say, like, I, instead of texting and saying, I'll be praying for you, I will text you the prayer I'm praying over you. I, love and, that. I mean, like, yeah, like that's, yeah, yeah. Like when somebody texts me that I'm trying really hard to get better at like when that is what, so, and I think w- what you said a second ago was about the fear that people see, the fear that people have of uh, expressing their faith in the workplace. And what you said about that, I think is really true because we're all walking around on eggshells in this really the season of why the, the, where we are as a culture of everybody gets canceled and this and that and whatever wokeness you want to talk about. But as a believer, we're not called to shirk back or step back and our boldness and our faith. And that's where, like, I, I've always joked that I think Peter was like my spirit animal. He was my, he's my biblical spirit animal is Peter. I love Peter. I love, <laughs> I love Peter. Peter. He's yeah. my favorite, man. He's actually the, su- I'm writing a book. I'll tell you about in a minute, but he's the subject of my chapter on discipleship at work. Oh he, yeah. 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 I love him. Okay. Well, I've been reading through first and second Peter in my quiet time recently. And it it's interesting, the boldness that yeah. you carry and the authority of Jesus that you carry inside you. I, I wish people could just take just a little bit of confidence and that mantle of authority that they walk into. Yeah. Uh, I, and if they, if you could walk in just a modicum of that authority that God has given us, oh, the difference you would make for the kingdom of Christ, no matter where you are. Amen. And you hit it, you hit the nail on the head when you said authority. Here's the mm-hmm. thing. I've met people that have spent lots of time with the Lord and they are just normal people. But yep. when they approach, and particularly if you're, if you as a believer are consider yourself under authority, which I do. Uh, mm-hmm. As a Marine, I love to think of Jesus as the CO, right? He's the commanding officer. He's, yeah. In my book, I call him Jesus is the CEO, right? So we're just uh-huh. stewards. So we're the chief operating officer. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, if you're under authority, then you have all the authority of whom which you are under authority. And yes. I think I said that right. And that's the point. You have all the power of heaven in your heart just waiting to be unleashed. And that's really the the difference. We have the the two judgments. We have the one judgment as to whether you're getting in or not. So we profess Jesus as Lord. You become immediately justified. And I really want the world to know this. You cannot become unjustified. No. Here's what you got to know. If you ever think there's a doubt that you could be unsaved once you're saved, if you're saved and you believe in the Lord, and then somehow you have all these doubts and you get to the point where you're just not sure... But here's the thing. If you're still thinking about it fearfully, you're still justified. That's the point is fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you're nervous, well, just start following the big 10 and you don't have to worry about it. Right. And that's the thing is is you don't get in because it works, but you can't work your way out of salvation either. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. That's what I think trips people up is because as believers, we want to look at somebody who's doing a bad thing and say, oh, you're going to go to hell. It doesn't work that way. Romans, the chapter, the the book on Romans is very clear about that. But the other thing is there is a second opportunity to prove yourself. And that's the Bema seat, right? So when we sit in the judgment seat of Christ, what God's doing or Jesus is doing is saying, hey, look, I'm the blueprint. How far off were you from the the job I had you? Now we've got the parable of the talents. So if you hid your talent, which is your time, treasure, resources, resources, talent, I don't think it's I don't think it's a surprise or or coincidence that talent was I think about seventy five pounds of gold. Yeah. But we also call that as a thing that you're endowed with that you couldn't that you couldn't necessarily earn. So I I don't think that's an accident. Oh, so there are no coincidences. Talent. No. If your gift is serving, well, go serve somebody because you're yeah. going to see the Lord work right then and there. I have right. a gift of teaching, encouraging, and leadership. Right. Those are my three. What I call my my, what I call my leading giftings or my leading motivational drivers, the other four are lagging. So I have to learn generosity, right? I didn't like giving to anybody right back in the day, (laughs) but I did it out of obedience. And now I am a cheerful giver. Like I have already exceeded my giving goal for the year. 
and I still have more opportunities and I'm like trying to find money so they can give it away. <laughs> uh, but that's what happens when you become a believer and you embrace the fact that no one can undo that. You're getting into heaven. Mm -hmm. Even like think about the guy, the thief on the cross, right? So he's yeah. beside Jesus. Now, a lot of people think that he didn't do anything to get into heaven and he didn't. But God's words echo into eternity. And there's no better example than that, because the thief on the cross got to see Jesus in paradise in that day. Yes. Well, we still tell that story. So his words, the thief's words, you really are the son of God, have echoed into eternity. So it doesn't matter how small of an impact you think you're making. You are making an eternal impact, even if you're just the one that's watering the soil on in Jerry's heart yes. so that someone later can come along and evangelize him. Yes. Make an impact. There are no small, there. there are no small deeds in the kingdom right. of God. There are no, because you have no idea the ripple and the effects that it's going to have. That's why you I really always say don't. it doesn't matter if you're a housekeeper or if you're the CEO, you oh. have a job. to. If your job in this world is to take the trash out, if that's God's gifting to you, the, the trip from the kitchen to the garbage dumpster is going to be the most amazing thing you've ever experienced in your life. So get excited about that. <laughs> I'm going to, can we record that? So I can tell I, we're recording that. I'm going to send that to my kids just oh, for the yeah, record. Do it. Do it. Yeah. I love it. Cameron jokes that I'm, that I think he's my favorite employee. Cause I always ask him to do the things. Yeah. So uh, anyways. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and we're, we're running out of time here. So I want to wrap up, but I would love for you. What would you offer if you know, just one thing that you, somebody who's looking to incorporate their faith in, into their professional or their working lives, what would be the one thing that you would tell them? That's just a baby step. Somebody could do. Ooh, the best baby step is to pray. Uh, right? Because you can do that yeah. alone. God doesn't want you out there on the street corner praying like the hypocrites, right? So yeah, pray alone, seek the Lord. Here's what I like to do. I actually read his word and then I'll just write out what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And what often happens is something comes out on the page that may or may not be what I thought would come out, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, is it's, it's how the Lord speaks to me. So praying alone is key. And however that manifests, maybe it's talking out loud. Maybe it's just being quiet because obviously if you're spending time with your friend, you're going to give them time to talk at some point. Yeah. Right. So let's stop our talking. Let's see what the Lord has to say. Just be quiet for 10 minutes. See what happens. You never yeah. know. But then, but that's the first step. The second step is just to get in the word. So maybe you spend five minutes being quiet and then another 10 minutes a day reading his word, either through a devotional or what have you, mm -hmm. right? So now you've only, you just committed 15 minutes. Do this before you check your emails in the morning. Yes. God may have something for you that you're not going to receive if you start thinking about emails. So mm. give him the first fruits of your day and see, once you've done those two things, now you've spent time with the Lord and you know what his word says. Once you know that, then you can recognize that intuition in, in, in your own spirit later on. And if you really want to take it to the next level, get around other believers, people that are more experienced than you, that are that are farther along in their faith that you trust. Yeah. Uh, and then share with them your ideas and thoughts about what you want to do with your time and money before you do it. Because they might say, hey, look, Jerry, that's a boneheaded idea. Don't do that. And then I'll be frustrated, but then I won't do it. Right. Which hmm. is the whole point. And we call those guardrails. And then the last yeah. thing is once you've spent time with the Lord, and you've listened and you and you read his word. Now you know what the Holy Spirit is going to say, because the Holy Spirit will never say a thing that contradicts the word. No. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to a thing that's what we call temptation. Uh, th that's not how God tests you. God mm -hmm. tests you in standing up for your faith in a way that builds your character and leads you towards a greater relationship with him. If something's going to lead you to sin, that ain't God. No. But if you read his word every day, you'll know which voice you're hearing. And yes. that's really the key is you can't look around in your life for circumstances to line up and think you're hearing from the Lord if you don't know what the Lord says. True. And that's well why said. I say the baby step is starting with prayer, just five minutes and then 10 minutes yes. or reading his word. If you do those two things and then go out there and just say, Lord, lead me today. Tell me what you yep. want for me. Because remember, God is CEO. We're just the chief operating yes. officer in this thing called life. And if that's your position, you've got everything you need to go out there and make a difference. Could not say that better myself, my friend. Man, oh, thank you. I could sit and talk to you for hours, buddy. This is so fun. <laughs> I'm having a blast. I'm having a blast. Let's go for another oh, hour. It'll be episode two. Well, how about this? Just come back again, okay? Yeah. We'll make up some other reason for you to come back. We'll have another session. We'll, oh, well, we'll talk. 
it actually I'm finishing the book. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. So that, I just agreed with to move with the publisher uh, yesterday. And, Congrats. Uh, that's so wonderful. It will be available in, in later this year, probably around December. I'll have it in my hand before January. But the reason What's the I name of your that, huh? December? December yeah, will be the book December, birthday. Probably, probably November, actually. But okay. the point is, it depends on how long me and the editors argue. So once that's done, then, then yeah. we'll have everything. But I would say pre-release type thing is going to be mid-November. And then you can order it in December. But the title is called Faith Driven Leadership. And then the subtitle is God's Blueprint for World-Class Business. Ooh. And if you aren't sure how to operate your life in the marketplace, this is going to be a great how-to guide. First, I'm going to give you the why. Why is it so important that you're a leader in the marketplace? Mm -hmm. I think communism and using slave labor to make cars and things that we have over the last 40 years is probably a great reason to get faith back in the marketplace. Seems um, reasonable. The algorithms and social media companies that are designed to take advantage of children and their lack of knowledge is probably a good reason why we need faith in the marketplace. But so the first part's that. And then the next part is what is a world-class business as it relates to faith? And then the most of the book, though, is that how do you do this? Where do you start? And so it's going to be, I think, a great culmination of why I believe faith, leadership, and business is inseparable as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, for sure. Oh, wow. We can, okay. We well, can, we can do episode two based on that when that launches. So I can promote it. I love it. I love shameless it. Shameless plug love for Jerry's book. You're oh. like, shameless plug. No, that's why I asked. I wanted to know the name of the book. And then I'll, once we've got that, I'll probably try to, well, I'll probably, I'm still working on my, well, let's wrap up and then I'll tell you all that. How about that? So I don't have to make it, my edit guy drive him crazy. So let me wrap up and then we'll stop recording. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I, th all that being said, man, Jerry, you and I could, I really do. I think you and I could talk forever, but our, it, it, it would appear our listeners probably have other things. They have to go back to work. Remember, we've got to let them go so they can go back to work and, and work for the kingdom of God. Right. So we'll, we'll definitely That's nice need to. Of you. I'm not. Hey. So I think that, you know what I think they're doing? I think they're doing nothing but listening to this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I listen. I lift weights. I go, I do oh, yeah. rough thing where you're walking. I do everything listening to podcasts. So that's um, what I do. Yeah. I'm a podcast junkie. Yeah. Oh, I assume everything. I do it when I'm doing anything, housework or working out. It's like it occupies my mind and takes it off of what I have to do. So I'm getting to like, it's like I get to listen to a podcast. And so right. that's, oh yeah. Well, anyways, thank you for being here. And hey, if people want to connect with you website or social media, is there anywhere you want to direct them? Yeah, I'm pretty active uh, on LinkedIn. And you can okay. just find me at Jerry Howard or my website for the business is Jerry Howard International. We do leadership development for you know typically larger companies, but then smaller companies, it's both leadership and business because a lot of times mm -hmm. they struggle with the right KPIs. So the website is jerryhowardinternational.com and they can connect right with me. Both me and my executive assistant get those emails, but then LinkedIn and we can talk and communicate. Uh, we just launched it. It's I don't have my courses up there yet, but I'm going to have some courses that are free that you can watch videos and then some devotionals. I just launched a Jerry Howard International community where we talk about faith, leadership and business. You don't have to be a believer to join. It's free to join and it will never cost you a dime. But what we want to make sure of is that people have a place to to talk about faith and ask those questions without the fear of getting shut down because a lot of social media wants to do that nowadays. So yeah. those are some great ways to connect with me in our team that we have some okay. other believers that work together too. So Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Listeners, I just wanted to, I just want to tell you wherever you are, whatever your amount or whatever you view as your amount of influence, I, I hope that today has just been an eye-opening experience that where whatever your influence, you can make immeasurable impact in the kingdom of God just by taking him with you into uh, each situation and every place you go. And you have no idea the the influence you're making. And you probably will never know the influence you're making until we, we stand on the other side and we meet a lot of people face to face. I hope that when we all get to heaven, that we get to see just, uh, yeah, I, I want to thank so many people when I get to heaven, those people that influenced me that never knew knew it. So keep just stepping out in your faith and being bold in what you are. And thank you guys so much for being here and good Lord willing. I will see y'all again next week. Thanks. All right. Stop.